Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Crime Family. This week, we will be covering a case that involves domestic violence, including but not limited to physical and sexual abuse. So we want to place a trigger warning right from the beginning because of the subject matter contained in the episode. The case we are going to cover, as well as our discussion of it, may be triggering to some listeners. We encourage you to please use discretion when listening to this episode. Domestic violence doesn't discriminate. It affects people from all ages, races, genders, cultures, countries, and socioeconomic status. According to the World Health Organization, about one in three women worldwide, so that's about 33% of women, have been subjected to either physical and or sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. Worldwide, about 27% of women aged 15 to 49, so that's almost one-third of women who have been in a relationship, report that they have been subjected to some form of physical and or sexual violence by their intimate partner. Domestic violence is a massively widespread issue that impacts so many people around the globe. This episode is dedicated to anyone who has experienced domestic violence either directly or indirectly, and to all the victims whose lives were tragically cut short due to the actions of their intimate partner. Jennifer Magnano is one of those people. This is part one of a two-part episode, and in this first part, I'm going to be telling you the extremely devastating case of Jennifer Magnano, a Connecticut woman who experienced intense domestic violence at the hands of her husband, Scott, resulting in unimaginable tragedy back in 2007. In fact, her case even helped to get a new law pertaining to domestic violence passed in Connecticut. So we're going to be discussing that case in this first part here. And then in part two, we're very excited because we have Amy Bryant here. She has extensive training on the topic of domestic violence. Uh, she's currently a writer and editor, and she has some experience in the criminal justice system as a parole officer. And she's most recently created some domestic violence recovery and trauma-informed communications courses, one of which is the Dauntless series. So it includes Dauntless recovery as well as dauntless communications and dauntless communications teaches how to change the way we address communications and conflict in the workplace so she's an expert on the topic of domestic violence and we're so excited to talk with her and have her perspective um, and as it pertains to the information in the jennifer magnano case as well so you can look forward to that in part two but for now, to kick it all off, I'm going to tell you guys about the Jennifer Magnano case. Um, so are you guys familiar with this case at all? Um, no, I'm not familiar with it at all. Um, I know a little bit about it, but I'm sure there's stuff that I didn't read or I haven't seen in documentaries. So I'm really interested to see all, hear all the details. All right. Um, so the, the bulk of this case occurs in 2007. At that time, the Magnanos were a blended family who were living in Terryville, Connecticut, in a beautiful home that looked pristine and perfect on the outside. Uh, but what was really going on within the home was far from perfect. The father of the household, Scott Magnano, could be best described as a tyrant. He and his wife, Jennifer, had two children, David and Emily, and there was also Jessica living in the house as well. Now, she was the eldest child, and she was Scott's stepdaughter from Jennifer's previous marriage. So there was just the five of them living in the home, in, in the main part of the house. Um, as early as 1992, Scott had threatened Jennifer, saying things like he would kill her if she ever left him. Um, this instilled in her from very early on an intense fear um, that pretty much lingered uh, for the entire duration of their relationship. So in the years leading up to 2007, and most specifically in the six years 
prior, which is when it became more and more intense, uh, the family endured domestic violence at the hands of Scott. Scott was a short-tempered dictator who, according to reports, wouldn't allow Jennifer or the children to do anything in the house without his permission. So, for example, Jennifer wasn't allowed to vacuum um, any of the parts of the house until Scott asked her to or told her that it was okay to. Everyone had to turn on and off a light switch in the correct way, because I guess there's a, a wrong way to do that. They were only allowed to leave the house when given permission, so Jennifer couldn't even go to, you know, like, get groceries or go to the bank or anything like that without permission from Scott. Um, they were all told how to wash their hands, how to walk into a room, how much soap to use, how to shower. So basically every aspect of their life was micromanaged and they were verbally or physically um, punished if they did not do these things that he would tell them. So David is the um, one of the kids. He's the middle child. He recalls in an episode of Inside Edition that was focused on the case, um, he says that the verbal abuse from Scott was always present in the household for as long as he can remember. But it was after the youngest child, Emily, was born, was when like the physical abuse began or like when it escalated and when he really became, like when he noticed it starting. Um, so in a specific incident that he mentions, which is really the first instance that he remembers that involved physical abuse towards his mom, um, Scott had expressed that he was unhappy in the marriage, to which Jennifer suggested that they get a divorce. And apparently this this comment set him off, and after that he allegedly took Jennifer into the bedroom and strangled her, almost killing her right then and there. And the physical abuse only escalated from this point forward, and it continued for years and years. And again, he was always saying that if she were to leave him, that he would kill her. So it wasn't like a matter of like where leaving was really even considered an option for them. Along with the verbal and physical abuse the family endured, Scott was also sexually abusing the oldest daughter, Jessica, uh, from the ages of 18 to 21. According to the episode of Inside Edition, Jessica recalls the first time that he had sexually abused her. And it happened one night after she had walked into a room in which Scott was snuggling with Emily and Scott asked for Jessica to join them in the bed, and their encounters included inappropriate conversations, inappropriate touching, and this all made Jessica extremely uncomfortable. And eventually, as time went on, Scott wanted only Jessica to quote-unquote snuggle with him in bed. Um, and in a cruel twist, Scott would actually often have Jennifer herself go and bring Jessica to him so that he could um, assault her. So it's like disgusting, evil, and cruel. Like, I couldn't imagine the agony that Jennifer would experience, you know, having to go and bring her own daughter to her husband so that he could sexually assault her. And obviously she probably feared for her own life or her daughter's life if she refused to do so. So it wasn't even really like a choice. She was pretty much forced to do this. So it's such a twisted and evil thing that only a monster would do. So those are just kind of some of the examples of some of the horrible things that he would do to Jennifer and the children. So like I said, the bulk of the case really happens in 2007 and it all begins on april 14th and this is the day that really set off sort of a chain of events um that led to the tragedy in this case so on that day scott was in a particularly bad mood um, according to an investigative report by michelle s cruz so she's an attorney and also a connecticut state victim advocate so she wrote about a 40 page report on this case and according to that report scott was very angry on this particular day because Jennifer had broken his mother's microwave while she was cooking dinner. While they were installing a new microwave, Scott screamed, I could kill you right now and have no remorse. So Scott was supposed to have a medical appointment that day and was enraged that he would miss the appointment because he'd have to spend the day fixing the microwave. So something like super trivial and something that's not really a big deal, but something so small set him off. Jennifer in that moment was trying to convince Scott not to worry about the microwave and instead just like go get ready for his appointment. Um, and her even suggesting this made him even angrier and he slapped her in the face. Then he went into the children's rooms and slapped Jessica across the face when she apparently like didn't respond to him or she defied him or what he says was defying him. It seemed to be another random violent outburst and one that they were unfortunately used to by this time but this was the distinct moment that jennifer decided to leave scott immediately she had already had plans to leave later that summer once the school year was over but on this day she just decided that she had had enough and she made a brave plan to escape the house later that evening that would have been in the morning where jennifer just made this decision and she had ended up like mouthing to the children that they were going to be leaving but scott was he remained in the house for the rest of the day so they couldn't actually like openly talk about it but they all knew that like at some point during that day they were going to like make a break for it so to speak 
Um, so b- before they did leave that day, Scott had called Jessica into his room to apologize for hitting her. And during this apology, allegedly had his hand up her shirt. So this was like his final um, time that he was sexually assaulting her again on the very same day that they were planning to leave. Uh, that night around 11 p.m., Jennifer and the three children made a mad dash and escaped in the family van while Scott was in the shower. And this was the first time that Jennifer um, or the children had ever attempted any kind of escape from Scott. So the next day, Scott called the local police department to report the family missing. And the day after that, Jessica's biological father also made a report to the Plymouth police uh, regarding Jessica being missing because he hadn't heard from her in quite a few days, which was pretty unlike her. And also because she wasn't showing up for work and she wasn't really the type to ever miss work. And it had gone on for a couple of days. So he ended up filing a police report or a missing persons report. And it was actually the second missing persons report because Scott had filed one the previous day. And on April 17th, which was three days after Jennifer and the children had left, the Plymouth police arrived at the family home to search the house and to speak with Scott. And it was during this encounter that Scott promised that he would never hurt Jennifer. And he had even mentioned that he wanted to seek counseling if that's what Jennifer wanted. So he seemed to be, you know, like the grieving husband who was concerned about his missing family um, and says that he wanted to go to like marriage counseling. Um, So he's trying to like appeal to the police officer and try to come off as something other than what he actually was. Did Jessica live in the house? Because I know she was uh, quite a bit older than the other two kids. Like, was she, did she like live in the house or did she just visit? Maybe in the last couple of years she didn't, but she was there obviously the day that they all left. Um, So I think she was living there at the time. But I don't know for 100% certain, but for all of these like major events that are happening, she's there for all of them. But yeah, she was a little bit older. Like she was, I think, 21. She was 21 at the time that they had left. And the other kids were, I think David was 15 and Emily was nine or so. Um, Is there any like information known? Like, did she ever talk to her father about what was going on or did she keep it kind of under wraps? Jessica? Yeah. Um, I think her father knew to some extent. And I'll get into it a little okay. bit later later on, oh, okay. but um I don't know exactly like what kind of stuff she had told him, but mm-hmm. he was aware of some things. I, I, I was just curious cuz like if he knew and then like she didn't really live there, I always wondered like why I guess she was kind of there to kind of protect the other kids, I guess. You could say because yeah. the other two weren't sexually assaulted, were they? As far as I know, no. Um it's never like been reported on that they were, but I don't know for sure. I kind of feel like since he wasn't really biologically his daughter, I mean, that doesn't make doesn't make it right anyways, whether you're a family member or not, but I just feel like he kind of chose her because she wasn't really family, and I feel like he kind of... Yeah. Who knows I mean, what people do? <laughs> yeah. Or why they do it, so... That's true. Anyways. Um... Yeah, so, like, I'm not exactly 100%. Like, in the report doesn't go into a ton of detail about, like, the specifics of, like, I think Jessica had left home at one point because she was, like, older and then she, like, came back to the house or something. I don't know exactly, like, the timeline of when she was lived there when she didn't, but she's there for, like, a, I know that she's there on the day that they moved out or they ran away. Um, and she was there for a lot of this major, like, events that happened in the case. So, so on the same day that the police went and spoke with Scott at the family home... The police also spoke with Tracy Gallo, who is a friend of the family. Uh, She says that she knew that Jennifer had mentioned a plan for the family to leave Scott in June because of the abuse that they were enduring. Um, So Tracy was aware of this, uh, and she actually shed some more light on even more horrific details about Scott's psyche and the abuse that the family was enduring, even going so far as, like, at one point he had allegedly had threatened to slit his own mother's throat because his mother knew about the abuse that was happening. So, um, it was just crazy. Obviously, this guy had issues threatening to slit his own mother's throat. So, obviously, something not right with him. Um, and then on the next day after this, this is so this was on April 18th, the police received a call from Jennifer. Uh, she would not disclose her location because she was terrified that Scott was somehow going to find her. Uh, but she called the police to identify herself in response to the missing persons report. And the police promised that they would not share her location with Scott. 
So after this conversation with the police, she was allegedly advised to go to a local shelter, but she was not advised to get a restraining order at that time. In a meeting with the police, Jennifer disclosed the extreme fear that she had for her and her children's lives because she had fled. So she, you know, she thought that Scott was going to be determined to find them and that he was going to track them down. Scott had always said that he would kill her and Jessica if they ever left him. And he also said that he would even kill Jennifer's sisters um, if she left as well. Um, however, she was also convinced that she would be killed if she did stay with him. So it's really like a catch-22 situation for the whole family. Um, like, they're truly damned if they do, damned if they don't. You know, she felt like she was kind of, uh, her fate was sealed either way. She knew that Scott would eventually kill her if she stayed in the in the marriage. And then if she left, it would probably, you know, set him off and he would kill her that way as well. So she really, you know, stuck like between a rock and a hard place. Shockingly, the officer to which Jennifer was disclosing this information to didn't file a report with the Department of Children and Families, and this is something that's actually required by law in the state of Connecticut, but for whatever reason he didn't actually file that, a report at that time. And so the family stayed in a motel for a week, um, like in the area or in the state of Connecticut, and eventually left the state completely and went to California. And here in California, they stayed at a, at a battered women's shelter. And in the meantime, the family did get a restraining order uh, from Scott. Um, but at the same time that the family was filing for a restraining order, Scott was actually filing for custody of David and Emily. Um, and this was actually something that Jennifer wasn't even aware of because Scott had insisted that the papers that were being served to her about the custody dispute were served to her at the family home and obviously she wasn't at the family home anymore so she was getting all of these papers served to her she wasn't even there so she didn't even know that scott was fight going to be fighting for custody so she couldn't even like take the proper steps to fight back because she had no idea it was even happening so it's just another thing that you know bad luck or went horribly for her and around the same time here as well, the police received a phone call from Tracy Gallo, and she was that family friend that had spoken to the police before, um, saying that Scott was harassing her over the phone, calling her multiple times a day, threatening her. Um, probably, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming probably like he might have thought that she knew where the where the family was, so he was probably harassing her, trying to get her to tell him where they were. Um, and then she did go to the police to stop him from harassing her there were no criminal charges that were filed and the police didn't really pursue anything from that um when jennifer and jessica were considering pressing charges against scott for the abuse that they had endured uh, throughout all of those years something crazy in the case was they were told that they could not have their claims investigated from california and they were told that they would need to return to connecticut for the investigation to occur and i obviously like I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the legalities of it. But to me, I feel like if somebody's coming forward saying that they were, you know, physically assaulted or sexually assaulted, I feel like just because they're in a different state, that doesn't mean that they can't file the report or like the investigation can occur. Like, to me, that just seems super weird. But again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know like the ins and outs of the legal system. So I think from the outside looking in, it sounds ridiculous, but maybe that is a common thing. I don't know. But I had never heard of it happening. Um, I didn't think that was like a state by state issue. I thought it was just kind of like you could report from anywhere, um, but I guess not. Um, so on June 4th, 2007, Jennifer was dealt a devastating blow when Scott was awarded full custody of the kids. Um, and she surmised that it was probably fraudulently under false pretenses that he got this custody, but also too, she wasn't even aware of like that he was filing for a while because like I said, all of the serving and the papers were going to her, the family home so she didn't even know for a while so she couldn't like actually fight against it and to me it just seems crazy like what kind of court would give him full custody um, but i guess if they're just looking at it objectively they're seeing like oh he's filing for custody and she's not filing back so maybe they just you know obviously they don't know the dynamics of the situation um, but the custody order gave jennifer four weeks to return the children to scott uh, which would give them until july 6th to do so because she was afraid of being arrested if she did not comply, Jennifer had no choice but to return to Connecticut with the children and fight for custody. So here she was thinking that, like, you know, she moved across the country. She's going to, like, get away from him for good. Now she's forced to basically go back to the same state. And during their time away in California, so it was only, like, because they left in April and they returned in June. So it was only, like, two months that they were gone. 
um, from Connecticut, but during their time away, Scott had also fraudulently been writing checks in Jennifer's name and placing unauthorized charges on her credit card. Um, so he actually ended up racking up about $83,000 in forged checks and nearly $6,000 in credit card debt. So it's like almost $90,000 um, over this like two month period, which is insane. On July 12th, Scott was ordered to leave the marital home and stay at least 100 yards away from Jennifer. Um, and the family was permitted to move back into the house under this order as well. So the police basically say Scott's got to leave the house and Jennifer and the kids can move back into the home. Um, but less than a month later, on August 5th, Jennifer contacted the Plymouth police to report that Scott had not yet vacated the family home, despite being ordered to by the court. And the police did basically nothing at this time. Uh, they said that the order was considered a civil matter, um, so they couldn't do anything, and they um, told her that she needed to contact her attorney. So, again, here she is going to the police saying all this stuff, and they're not helping her in any way. And not only are they not helping her, but they're actively like making it harder for her to actually, you know, file reports or like do to like be safe against this guy who's been horrible to her. At some period um, around this time, Jennifer was eventually granted custody of the children. So I don't know. The report didn't go into detail. Like I don't know where they were staying because I know they came back to Connecticut in. I believe probably late June, maybe early July, um, but they don't return to the actual house until August. So I don't know where they were staying in the month of July. Like if they were staying at a friend's house or if they were staying at a shelter, like, I don't know, but they weren't actually at the home um, because Jennifer was convinced that Scott had never actually vacated the home, which is why she called on August 5th to report that he hadn't left the house, even though he was ordered to. And then another thing that goes horribly wrong for Jennifer. So on August 17th, the assistant state attorney refuses to sign a domestic violence warrant application that was submitted um, on behalf of Jennifer. And the reason that he refused to sign it was because of the fact that she had waited two months to make the formal complaint. And in a quote from the assistant state attorney, he says, is this an attempt to use the court as leverage in their divorce case? So the state victim advocates report that a lot of this information is coming from uh, claims that this sentiment by the state attorney is pretty much identical to Scott's own version of the facts because Scott had also claimed to police that Jennifer's accusations of abuse, sexual assault, credit card fraud, and all that stuff was just an attempt to gain leverage in the couple's court proceedings. Um, cause they were also, she had filed for divorce in this time as well. So they were going through that and the custody battle. So the state attorney clearly showed which side he's on. Like, so like in what world do we live in where like the state attorney is going to side with this man who's like a known abuser um, over a battered woman because she waited two months to file the complaint. Like two months isn't that long of a time um, considering they endured it for years. And we all know like reasons why the women don't come forward right away. And like, obviously if she's feeling threatened, like he said he was going to kill her if he ever, she ever left. So she's not going to be like, you know, jumping at the chance to like file a report because that's like a pretty like, you know, big step for her to make. Um, so the state attorney just didn't care and clearly didn't, I don't know if he didn't believe Jennifer or like whatever, but he wouldn't sign the the uh, domestic violence warrant um, application. So she wasn't able to get that either. So on August 22nd, 2007, so this was the first time since fleeing on April 14th that Jennifer had returned to the marital home. In later interviews um, with Jessica and her biological father, so they claimed that Jennifer felt pressured by authorities to return to the house because she had been told by like various people that the kids should return to their regular school to provide them with continuity. So they were pretty much saying like, you need to return them to the house and to their regular school to like get them back to normal and stuff. So Jennifer felt like she had real, really no choice but to go back to the house and probably almost felt a little bit guilty if she didn't saying like she was doing it for her selfish reasons or like she was depri depriving the kids of like some sort of like normalcy um so that's kind of the way that they were making her feel so anyway she did go back to the house but before she returned jennifer had called the police and asked for help in returning to the house because she was terrified that scott was still inside possibly you know just lying in wait waiting for her to enter and so the police did come and they did a search of the house uh, but they did not search the basement apartment. And that's where Scott's mother, Mary Lou, resided. His mother lived in the basement apartment of the house. So they didn't check the basement apartment and they didn't check Scott's locked office either. So in fact, Mary Lou refused to allow the police to enter her apartment and claimed that she hadn't seen Scott in days. Jennifer was convinced, though, that Scott was in that basement apartment and would like come out at nighttime to kill her um, and possibly the children. 
But instead of gaining a search warrant to check the basement apartment or doing literally anything, the police basically did nothing. Once again, they all they did was recommend to Jennifer that she go to the courts to request to have Mary Lou removed from the premises. Um, but this process would take time and time was something that Jennifer just simply did not have. So I don't know. I guess on the 22nd when she returned to the house, she was there overnight, I guess, because on the 23rd of August, she was at the home earlier in the in the day. Did they not get a search warrant to search the apartment? I feel like that's something they you didn't. would do. I don't Especially know why if they the didn't, mother's like refusing but... to like let you in. That's what I don't, that's what I don't understand. That's like, here we go again. Like shoddy police work. Like every other case we've done so far this year. Yeah, I just think, like, I don't know, like, they I, just, for whatever reason, they just did not care, like, or it seemed like they did not care. It seems like every situation is, like, against Jennifer, like, everything she does, like, the courts and the police are, like, like opposing her, like, it's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, she, does, A, she doesn't know that they're, he's filing for custody, she loses custody because of that, then she, they pretty much force her to go back to Connecticut because... They can't do an investigation into the her allegations unless she's in Connecticut. So she goes there, and then, like, Scott isn't removed from the house, and she can't go back there because he's there. The police aren't doing anything. Like, every literally every single thing. It's really annoying. Also, I thought you couldn't just, like, send, like, someone's going to sue you. You can't just send papers to their house. Like, you know, but I guess this shows, like, my lack of knowledge for, like, the law. But, like, when you see in movies when they, they, they chase somebody down and they, like, ask them their name... And they have to admit to it, and then they give them the papers, so they can't say, oh, I never got them. It's like, well, that's why they do that, is to make sure that they give it to the right person. And, like, that yeah, obviously I'm... didn't happen. So I guess that's not a thing that happens every time. I just assumed it was. I mean, and maybe, like, maybe it is supposed to happen, they just didn't. Like, you know, maybe they were going against Yeah, right, you know, maybe that was process. just another, yeah, another, like, we don't really care, let's just do this kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, because clearly, like, I mean... They didn't know where she was, I'm sure. It's not like they necessarily knew what her address was, but, like, I feel like they had to have known she wasn't there anymore. Or, like, if they're serving her with these papers and she's never, like, responding to any of them. Like, it just seems weird. And then they would grant him custody, being like, oh, well, she didn't like, she didn't file, so she must not care. Like, to me, it's just weird. I don't know. Well, yeah, I feel like that's why they do that. Like, serve it to the person they know they served it, so there's no excuse to them to be like, well, I never got them. It's like, well, you did because I gave them to you directly. Like, but yeah, maybe, maybe I they thought that she did get them and she just didn't care. Like, she wasn't fighting it. Like, you know what I mean? I like, maybe they thought, like, like, oh, he's fighting for custody. Up. Yeah. Yeah. I also feel like the obviously police didn't care about Jennifer and the kids. Just because, like, I feel like he's, she ran away for a reason. And she's filing a report. Somebody who was just trying to kidnap the kids. But again, just... because there was no there was no report with the department of family children and families like, and there's no like record of it so they don't even know she ran away probably at this point like who knows if she actually ran away like i don't think it was ever she was considered a missing person at first yeah and then she called in to like respond to the missing person so they're like okay she's not missing and like she didn't disclose to the police all this information but like there was never on record anywhere that she had actually but from ran the, away. like that's what i'm saying from the get-go like somebody didn't report that to the police yeah, whatever. it's almost like, like her following. Yeah, like her following the law is what like made her like you know made the situation worse, right? If she would have like just stayed missing, then you know she would have had an excuse not to. I didn't receive the papers, you know what I mean? Like, but she's like, I'm not missing, and I don't know. It just seems like everything she did, even though she was trying to do the right thing, like compounded into this really bad situation. Yeah, I mean, it would she... been better if she would just not have listened. To the, to the law basically yeah exactly and like at the time when she like called in to respond to the missing persons report like the officer that she talked to like it goes the report goes into like more detail about she actually like went and had a physical meeting with um the tracy gallo the friend the family friend so like somehow like she knew the police officer through like some connection with like her kid's school so like she trusted that officer enough and then like he set up a meeting between tracy and jennifer um is what it says in the report and then then she meets with the police officer who discloses all this and he, she discloses all this stuff to the police officer and the police officer just says okay i suggest you go to a shelter but didn't say like oh you should file for a restraining order so that's why she didn't file for a restraining order so there was no restraining order in the state of connecticut at that time and there was no no um report with the department of children and families so Literally on paper, there's literally no record of this even happening. Right, because they literally told her not to. So, yeah, it's like she listened to them and that's what... And, like, I guess I shouldn't say... 
maybe I, sh I shouldn't say he he recommended her not file a restraining order. It said that he just didn't advise her to get one. So it's not like he said you shouldn't get one. He just said he didn't say, oh, you should. You know what I mean? Like he didn't say anything right. about a restraining okay. order. So okay. it was like, you know, <laughs> a small difference in the wording there. But um, <laughs> I get, yeah, I don't think he was saying like, don't get one. He just didn't say get one. Um, but yeah, I feel so like it, in oh, those ahead. situations, like a restraining order is like, like the thing you do. Like maybe like I, I don't like I, I could be wrong. Like I'm not any like a legal person, but I feel like do you have to ask somebody to get a restraining order? Can the police just automatically do it? I think you have to like re request one. Like the police can't just grant a restraining order between two people if the person doesn't request it. Yeah, there has to be like proof of like I think you can request one and be denied. Like there has to be proof of why you need one. You can't just like hmm. ask for yeah, one and get it automatically. So, but I feel like we see time and time again. Like there are other cases I'm sure where, where you know the woman does go to get a restraining order and is denied for like bogus reasons, and then like the person ends up killing her because they didn't have a restraining order. Um, or even if you do get a restraining order, like, I feel like in this, these kind of cases, like, obviously these people, like, Scott doesn't care about the law. Like, why do you, why do you think a restraining order is going to be like, oh, well, like, you have a restraining order, I can't come near you. Like, this guy clearly doesn't care about what's legal and what isn't. Well, yeah, if someone's going to kill you, like, breaking a restraining order is, like, the last thing on their mind, right? They're going to kill you. They're going to go to jail for murder anyway. Like, who cares if they broke this restraining order, basically? They don't care. Yeah, and this guy was, like, committing all these, like, forgery, like, writing bad checks, like, credit card fraud. Like, obviously, he was, like, abusing her and sexually assaulting his stepdaughter. So, like, this is a guy who's not going to be, like, you really think that same guy is going to be, like, oh, well, I'm not going to go near her because she has a restraining order. Like, I can't break that law. But all the other yeah. stuff is okay. I feel like a restraining order, though, maybe just be, like, a reason for the, like, the courts to be, like, okay, like, he broke the restraining order, so now there's, like, cause for, like, she needs protection, that, you know, he should go to jail, that kind of thing. But, like, if that's not in place, then they really don't have proof that anything happened, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. So I guess it is something, like, on paper that would provide It also could, it also could turn out to be the opposite, like they get a straining order he doesn't he's even more angry now because she got the straining order and now he has more f fits of rage and even more angry could be two-way street there yeah like but. i think it's just i don't know i think i think it's such a complex thing i think people think like oh just get a restraining order and then i'll be i'll be good like oh he can't go near you and then it's like yeah, but that's not really how it works like ever i feel like i don't know do people abide by restraining orders like Especially someone who's like that violent and that obviously like doing illegal things. Yeah, I feel like board. I feel like they're not going to work to protect someone if they're out to like kill you. But well, again, I think it's just like that's a, the case, a, it's like a step in the process for like legal action to be taken more seriously. Yeah, I was gonna say if every abuser got a restraining order, then it probably would have been less people killed. But that's not always how it goes. <laughs> so. I feel like, yeah, if someone's, it's not, that's a sad thing. If someone's determined to kill someone, like, I don't think it matters what. Yeah. Not that it doesn't matter, but, like, something so, so simple it. as a restraining order. I, I mean, you can. I don't think it's not, it's not like it's a lost cause. But, you know, I just think it's, like, so, so much more complex than just saying, like, oh, just get a restraining order. And that's it. Case closed. Like, no. Um, yeah, so it's pretty fucked up. And as you can see, like, pretty much all throughout this whole thing, like, roadblock 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 like everything she tries to do with the police like doesn't really happen the way she would probably intend it to but um so like on august 23rd she's at the home like early in the day so i don't know i guess she stayed overnight at the house because 20 22nd was when she went back to the house but anyway she was there earlier in the day and she, when she was going to leave the house so she left the blinds up and the lights on so this way she would like know if someone had been in the home while she was gone, like if she returned and obviously the lights were off or the blinds were down, then she would kind of know. So it would be like a, a hint to her. Um, so sure enough, when she returned to the home just after 630 that evening, the blinds were down and the lights were off. So she called the police to inform them of this. And then the police came once again to do a, a check of the house before she went in. So again, they checked all parts of the house except for the basement apartment and Scott's office. For the second time, Mary Lou... Scott's mother refused to allow officers to enter her apartment to check. So the police had no like legal, re like they couldn't do anything. She refused to let them in. She also says that she hadn't spoken to Scott in days. So she had no idea where he was and she hasn't really had any communication with him. 
So the police left, and then Jennifer had the assistance of a neighbor to change the locks of the house, or to help her change the locks of the house. But later that night, it was just after 11 o'clock, Scott came from seemingly out of nowhere and attacked Jennifer. Uh, He pulled her out of the house by her hair, and after physical altercation, and took her to the front steps of the house, where he shot her multiple times in the back and head at close range. David and Emily, so the two youngest kids, both witnessed the attack, and right after it, David ran to his mother to check for a pulse, but unfortunately she was dead. Scott then fled the house um, and shortly afterwards killed himself with a gunshot to the head. So after all that, they, you know, finally ran away and they thought that they were going to, you know, live this happy life. They went to California and then because of all the legal stuff, they were pretty much forced to go back to Connecticut where he was. And because she didn't have the support of any of like law enforcement or anything, she ended up going back to the house where he was basically waiting for her. Um, so it's just really, really sad. Uh, shortly after the murder, police finally inspected Mary Lou's apartment, basement apartment. So, of course, they go in after the fact. Um, this is when they go into the house. But what they found in some of the things that they found in the basement apartment were questionable. So in the kitchen, they found a baby monitor receiver. Um, just in like a basket on the kitchen counter. And then upstairs, in an upstairs cabinet of the main house, they found the transmitter portion of the monitor. So, you know, police uh, surmise that Scott had been using this monitor to spy on Jennifer so he would know when she was in the home. Um, And then people were like putting, you know, all eyes were on Mary Lou because they were like, obviously she would have known, she would have seen this baby monitor. And like, they were just kind of trying to assume that Mary Mary Lou might have known um, some of the things that Scott was doing or like the tactics that he was doing but clearly he was using that to spy on the main house so he would know when Jennifer was there that's why when she went to the house that night he knew that she was there and that's how he was able to like come from out of nowhere seemingly also after talking with the police Mary Lou admitted that she was aware that Scott had hidden his car inside the garage of a neighbor's home uh, who was on vacation so that Jennifer would not see the car in the driveway So again, she knew that he was hiding that as well. And reports do allege that Mary Lou, when she said that she hadn't spoken to Scott in a few days, uh, that's what she said. It clearly wasn't true. Apparently she had arranged to try to have him stay at a friend's house um, instead of with her. And that was like in the days immediately up, like preceding the murder. So she was talking to him throughout this time. And also it's alleged that she did have knowledge that Scott had asked her brother, so I guess it would be his uncle, for a gun. So these are all things that she knows that are taking place. And the report also does allege that Mary Lou had slapped Emily after Emily made a negative remark about Scott right after the murders had happened. So clearly she's showing that's like showing what side she's on. Like, oh, she, you know, Emily saying something about her father that just murdered her mother in front of her, and Mary Lou takes it out on her. So Mary Lou's part in all of this is pretty sketchy as well. And up, uh, as of today, there's been no criminal charges that were ever brought against Mary Lou for any of this, even though all of that information is pretty sketchy. Does it ever come out that maybe like Scott was telling his mother that, like, you know, Jennifer was the one that was abusive and she was brainwashing the kids to be against him and she like kidnapped them and moved. And so his mother was, you know, very against her because she believed what he was saying, like, anything like that ever come out well nothing like that but there was things in the report that mentioned that um, in the past like any time if Mary Lou had tried to um, intercept in like a physical altercation between Scott and Jennifer that he would like turn his rage on her and threaten her so like I guess she didn't just want or any threat to like if she called the police or like you know, and he also said, remember the, that family friend said that he threat, he threatened to slit his mother's throat if she had ever said anything because she knew about the abuse. So clearly this is probably, she was also par- partially a victim of him as well, like probably terrified that her son's going to kill her if she does so much as like go to the police or say anything to anyone. But there's also a difference between like not saying something to someone and then also like being like an active, not an active participant, but like knowing that he's like hiding his car in like the neighbor's garage so that Jennifer wouldn't see it and basically allowing him to stay with her in the basement apartment and knowing that he's spying on and getting a gun like I feel like knowing that he's getting it would be like you know like the end of the road for her okay I gotta do something now 
Yeah, exactly. And like in all those steps, she did nothing. And then also to the, it's alleged that she was also there at the scene when he murdered Jennifer. So apparently like when he came out of nowhere, she was following him and she was saying like, don't do this now or saying stuff like that. So she was like there during it all. And then slapped Emily when Emily was saying negative things about Scott. It's like, yeah, her, her involvement is, I don't know, something going on there, but there was never any like criminal charges that were ever brought against her and also not allowing like, well, well, also not, seems like... well, not allowing the police to check the basement apartment too. Like clearly Scott was in that apartment. Like why else would she not I mean, allow them to search? Like idiot might seem like a strong word, but well, I feel she, like she, I, she was a victim as well. I feel, but like, yeah, yeah. but Maybe. also like, like he her threatened too. her like, who, yeah, who knows yeah. if he lived, was in that apartment with her, who knows what he was doing to her? Like, and like, you if he's threatening yeah. to slit her throat, if she says anything, like, obviously this woman's like, fucking terrified of him. So like, she's a victim too, but like, yeah, she, she there was has probably to be some scared. culpability. Yeah. And also like, that's her son. So she's trying to like, give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe, you know what I mean? Like, just trying to support him. He probably told her things that weren't true. So yeah, I feel for her as well. And, and like, maybe I shouldn't be too hard. I mean, I, I'm sure she probably feels pretty terrible about what it all led to like i'm sure she probably has regrets or like things that she wishes she'd done differently but then also like you know slapping emily right after she says like that negative thing about scott like it's just that's a weird reaction weird thing to do when you know your son just murdered her mother you know it's like how dare you say something negative about this guy that just murdered your mother like it's a very bizarre reaction to have the mother is just like i said it's something going on there so in the years since jennifer's murder her three children have continued advocating for her uh, in 2020 jennifer's law was first introduced to the connecticut general assembly so the law would expand the definition of domestic violence to include coercive control uh, a type of domestic violence that includes threats humiliation or other tactics in an attempt to frighten harm or punish the victim so this can include but is not limited to isolating the victim from family and friends stalking intimidation, controlling of one's everyday activities, and depriving the victim of basic necessities. So Jennifer and her children endured like all of these types of abuse for years, and this expansion in the bill would allow courts to officially recognize these acts that fall within that definition to be considered domestic violence and therefore a criminal offense. So the law was named Jennifer's Law partially in honor of Jennifer Magnano's case. And like in the court proceedings to like get the bill passed, actress Evan Rachel Wood testified in favor of the bill. And in 2021, the law was officially passed. I guess that's, I don't want to say a silver lining, but I guess that's a good thing that came out of that. Um, but it's a pretty tragic case and it's pretty unfortunate that it had to, you know, her, it was her death that led for that. Like if there had been laws in place before this, then maybe something would have been different. But I guess as we can see, like, the police seemed like they didn't really care the whole every step of the way. So I feel like there probably were some laws that were in place, but they just didn't follow. So well, I can't believe that wasn't a law until 2021. Like that seems crazy. I know. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I think it's good that the kids are like advocating for her because we know like domestic violence doesn't just affect, I mean, the kids were victims as well, but it does affect if it's like a mother and father kind of thing, it definitely affects the kids as well. Yeah, like, it could be very easy for, you know, one of the kids to, like, do that to their partner when they get older because they experienced it as a child. But they're, like, you know, advocating for, like, these laws and stuff. So they're they're making good out of that situation versus just perpetuating the same cycle. So, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be, I, I think our, our talk's going to be interesting because it's good to hear, like, I don't know, she's obviously, she's an expert on domestic violence. She has a lot of training mm-hmm. in, like, the topic. So there's certain things that we just don't know um, that she might be able to talk about. And I had, like, I, ha- I have a, I have had a few li- a few interactions with her already and, like, just some of the things that she's mentioned. So I'm really interested to pick her brain and, like, have her talk about those on the podcast as well. So very excited to have our conversation. And she's familiar with this case a little bit as well. So maybe she can, like, touch, talk about Jennifer's Law uh in particular um and also she's uh, i believe she's living in colorado so she might have like a different perspective of like laws that are in colorado that about domestic violence so it's gonna be an interesting conversation so i'm excited for that but i do just want to put out there like some resources for anyone if anyone is experiencing domestic violence in um, their life so there's a good resource uh, endingviolencecanada.org 
uh, is a really good resource. I'm going to put that in the show notes. So that has a list of all of the resources across Canada. It breaks it down by province, um, which is really, really good. And then if you are in the States, there's a really great resource, thehotline.org. And this also has a lot of resources um, in terms of how to identify abuse, your planning for safety. Um, and there's also some uh, a phone line you can call. So it's 1-800-799-SAFE. It's 1-800-799-7233 or 1-800-787-3224. Or you can text START to 88788. And that's if you're in the States. And uh, we'll put the link to that website as well there. So those are some good resources as well. And this episode is airing in October, which October is National um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the U.S. And November is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Canada. So we're kind of like airing this episode right in between those. Um, so there's some resources for that as well. So we'll, we'll I'll link that to the in the show notes as well. Yeah, did you guys have any like final thoughts about the case? I just feel really sad for Jennifer for not having the support of the police and just not taking her seriously. And if they did, this tragedy probably would never happen. And if the mother-in-law would cooperate, then. So I just feel I just like I feel like a lot of people in her in Jennifer's case don't get the support from the people that they should get support from. Yeah. And that, unfortunately, like, this is just one case and probably millions of them are in the U.S. Mm-hmm. or in Canada or around the world. So this is definitely not a unique case. Um, each case probably has their own, like, unique factors. But unfortunately, it's a huge, a huge issue. And so I am going to put in the show notes as well. There's a, the, in, the episode of Inside Edition because the interview, the three kids, um, and they go a little bit more into Jennifer's Law and stuff. So that's a really interesting watch. And then also there is a documentary coming out about the case. It's called Jennifer 42. And it's going to be an animated documentary, like narrated, talking about this case, but it's animated. So it's it really looks really interesting. So I'm going to put a link to the trailer for that. Um, there's no release date as of yet, but it is upcoming. So look forward to that as well so thank you so much for tuning in to part one of our two-parter episode we hope you enjoyed listening about this case um, even though it was very heavy and traumatic and very sad we hope that you um, did learn a little bit and we're excited because you're probably going to learn a lot more about the topic of domestic violence in our next episode because we do have Amy Bryant coming on the show to talk to us and she's an expert on the topic so we're very excited to hear her perspective so as always you can follow us on Instagram at Crime Family Podcast you can follow us on Twitter at Crime Family Pod 1 and on Facebook at Crime Family Podcast we do have a Gmail account so you can email us at Crime Family Podcast at gmail.com. You can send us case suggestions, tips, ideas, and you know, feedback about, about the show. And um, so we're very excited to hear from you. So thank you so much for listening. And we'll be back next week with part two and our conversation with Amy Bryant. Take care.